that's too far away. Try it again. This uh, next lecture is a continuation of the tunnel and the uh, name of the book is Fast Lane to Heaven. by Ned Dougherty and I'm quoting from page 21 uh, Dan is a friend of Ned's that was killed in the Vietnam War uh, Dan goes through the veil into the spirit world and uh, this is part of the conversation here. Dan communicated to me, you are on the threshold of an important journey. Each of these places and events that are before you are for you to absorb as much as you can. It is important that you remember everything that you see before you. You will be going back and you must go back with what you experience. You have a mission ahead of you in your life and this experience will guide you on that mission. As Dan and I communicated, we were suspended motionless in front of the energy tunnel. As Dan communicated that it was time to move on, my attention refocused on the tunnel. Dan led me toward the tunnel and his presence was to my left and we moved forward. I realized that I was comfortable with the fact that I had an ethereal human form but not a material body. I recognized that my being was in a natural state of existence free of the limitations of the human body. I did not miss my human body and realized what a hindrance it was to be imprisoned in one. As we moved forward into the tunnel, I recognized that I was moving forward by free will and not by appendages. No arms, legs, or other devices were required to obtain movement. I simply thought to move forward, I willed it, and the movement was accomplished. In an earthly sense, I felt more like a dolphin in water than a human on land. As we entered the tunnel of energy, I heard a loud and continuous whooshing sound surrounding us and I felt as if we were entering a vacuum, except I heard, very sharply and clearly, the melodious sound of chimes and crystals and other wonderful but unearthly sounds. I focused my attention on the composition of the walls of the tunnel as we moved forward. They resembled a massive ocean wave in a tubular form. 
My curiosity caused me to reach out in the direction of the wall to my right. As I touched its essence, a profusion of crystal-like liquid sparks danced and exploded in brilliant colors. The sparks of bright light were accompanied by the synchronous, synchronous sounds of crystal-like chimes. I was already hearing the melody sounds of crystals and chimes from the time we entered the tunnel. This new profusion of sounds caused by my disturbing the energy should have clashed with the other sounds, but the new pattern of sounds complemented and intensified that continuous melody. This composition of sounds was far beyond the ability of any human composer to create. I realized that my disturbing the energy field in the wall of the tunnel was easily absorbed by the power and energy responsible for the tunnel. Dan and I were traveling through a vehicle of energy that was so simple yet so complex that its nature was beyond description. I turned back to Dan and communicated my wonderment of what I was experiencing. If I had to communicate my thoughts by words, I would have been speechless. I communicated that thought also and Dan understood. I was experiencing the ineffable. Relax. Everything is okay, he repeated. Trust the experience. My attention was then drawn to the magnitude of the tunnel. At the distant opening before us, I could see a universe of brilliant stars. I pondered the purpose of the tunnel. It seemed to stretch from Earth into the universe for a distance measured in light years. We seemed to be traveling very slowly through the tunnel, although we were moving through incredible distances in space. It seemed as if the tunnel of energy reduced the distance between the Earth and our destination. It was as if we were traveling up an escalator at a 45 degree angle at the speed that an escalator could normally move in a department store. Yet, we were moving through light years of space in a matter of minutes. It was obvious that the restrictions of mass, time, and space as they were measured in the physical world did not apply in the ethereal realm through which we were traveling. Dan and I were not limited by them. The tunnel of energy served several purposes. It was a mass of energy that directed and assisted our travel. It was a creation designed to contain us in an environment in which we felt comfortable and secure as we travel at an enormous speed through incredible distances in a very short period. Suddenly, we exited the tunnel and were suspended in a universe of bright stars. We were still moving forward in this environment as if we were astronauts propelled through space, but unencumbered by spacesuits. We were moving like angels without wings. Dan was still guiding me. I looked back and noticed that the tunnel of energy was no longer visible. Instead, I was looking deep into a void of space. I knew Earth was in the direction from which we had come, but the planet was now just a speck of light among a million stars. Fast Lane to Heaven by Ned Dougherty. The next quotes come from The Journey Home by Philip L. Berman. Now Philip is doing some research and some commentary 
And uh, so I'm going to include just a couple of paragraphs uh, from his. And I'm quoting now on page 28 and 29. In her books, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross writes about others who have experienced life after death. But I don't know about her work, I didn't know about her work until a year after I got out of the hospital. She talks about the sensation of being in a tunnel, a very dark tunnel, and approaching light. And I felt that I had entered and traveled down that tunnel. And it was the last and most powerful experience I had. It was interesting because I had a feeling of peace and anticipation but also a bit of discomfort, because there was this very uncomfortable sound. The closest thing I can relate it to is when my automatic washer is on spin. It was kind of that sort of hum, but the further I moved toward the light, the more I got inside the tunnel. The quieter the sound became. So we go from chimes to a dishwasher, or a clothes dryer. And I was glad to be leaving it behind. I did not see friends in the tunnel. I did not see people. And my life did not flash before me, which is different from some experiences I have heard of. All I remember is that I was getting closer and closer to the light. Okay, this book is called Transformed by the Light by uh, Melvin Morris, uh, a doctor, a researcher, and uh, I'm just pulling uh, a page from his research and commentary. Uh, and I'm on page 54. I was being helped by someone to move up this tunnel. When I arrived at the end, uh, Dr. Morris is quoting, of course, one of his patients. When I arrived at the end, there was a lovely visual spread out before me. Vista, excuse me. There were all fit. There were all filled with flowers, and there was a nice road over on my right, and the trees were painted white halfway up, and there was a white fence. It was lovely. And there were the most gorgeous horses I have ever seen in the pasture off to the right. I would have to cross two fences to get to these horses, but since I was nine years old, there was no doubt where I was going. I started off that way, and after a little while, there was a white kind of light, a presence beside me that was friendly and not at all threatening. The presence said, Where are you going? And I said, I'm going over there. And he said, that's great, we'll come along. There were a lot of flowers that I had never seen before. And I was asking him their names and picking them as we went along. And I was talking to him, this blinding white light that was all colors and no colors at the same time. And it didn't have a face or features per se, but that didn't bother me. I remember looking back down the tunnel at the people crowded around the bed, and I didn't care that I was up here and my body was down there. I felt very good, as a matter of fact. So I was talking to this light and wandering over to these horses I had just gotten my leg over the top rail of the fence and in the horse pasture when the voice out of nowhere said, What is she doing here? And the light answered, 
she came to have the horses. And the voice said, it's not right, it's not her time, she has to go back. At this point, I was clutching the rail because I didn't want to go back. That was the last thing I wanted to do. And the voice talked to the white light a little bit more, and they decided that I would have to go back. So I threw a tantrum. I pitched a royal fit. I grabbed onto the rail of the fence and wrapped my arms and legs around it and I wouldn't let go. The voice just laughed. Look, you can have it later, but that is not the, but this is not the time, and throwing a tantrum is not going to do you any good. So she sees the tunnel going back to the earth into the hospital room where she was at. Okay, last one in this segment, this lecture comes from Secrets of the Light by Danian Brinkley and this is his he had three near-death experiences and he wrote a book after each one and this is after his third near-death experience and he goes into some deeper things that he knew about in the first and second experience but he never shared and uh, I'm quoting now from page 85 in Secrets of the Light. As frightening as the last thought I need to share with you is, I feel compelled to tell it. After my extended stay in the blue gray space, I realized that if the number of souls there continue to grow at this rate, Within the next couple of decades, we will have to very we will have a very serious afterlife situation on our hands. Now pay attention to what he's worried about. You see, it is already filled with millions of souls. A few million more will create a critical clog. At that point, one of two things can happen. Either the souls already in the blue-gray space will seep back into this world, bringing with them tremendous misery and fright, or the souls leaving this world will be unable to get through the tunnel and into the light. Either way you look at it, this is a prospect beyond terrifying. To be completely honest, I think the backlog from the netherworld has already started to overflow into our reality. This is validated by the recent reports of a 700% increase in exorcisms performed by Catholic priests over the past decade. Interesting. Now, others obviously would disagree with that. Uh, the one I very started with, the very first, we each have our own tunnel, but he's concerned about there just being one tunnel and it getting clogged with spirits going and coming and getting, uh, having effect on us. Okay? So, I didn't do too bad. Uh, 20 minutes. So that's the end of uh, the tunnel two. The Tunnel uh, Lecture 3. My first quote comes from Beyond the Veil, Volume 1, 
by Lee Nelson. Put it up a little closer. And uh, he's got four volumes, uh, uh, collection, and uh, a lot of them f are from Mormons. Uh, Lee is a Mormon and uh, worked for a paper in Salt Lake City. So I'll begin on page, what page? 67. I remember thinking the doctor would give up on me if I didn't give them a sign. I had been gone from my body, but now I was back. I had to let them know. If I could just open an eye or wiggle a finger, they would know I was there. I was in the intensive care unit at Orem Community Hospital. It was November 1986. I had just suffered a cardiac arrest. Because of what had just happened, I no longer just believed in an afterlife. I knew, for a surety, there was life beyond death because I had just been there. I was in a tunnel. The only reason I call it a tunnel is because I can't think of a better word. It was like a long valley with rounded sides. I wasn't shown, or I can't remember, the first part of the tunnel, but the part I remember is clear like I was there yesterday. Maybe I wasn't allowed to remember what happened on first entering the tunnel. At the end of the tunnel was a large room with a door at the far end. I don't know why the door was significant to me, only that it was. There were people in the room I knew when I was within five feet of the end of the tunnel that if I entered the room, I would not go back. I don't know how I knew that. I just knew there would be no coming back once I entered the room. No one told me not to go into the room, and I didn't feel any fear about entering. I just didn't do it. Human words are not adequate to describe the beauty of the room. There was a lot of light, a brightness that went beyond just white, kind of a many-colored iridescence. We don't have the words in our language to describe the beauty, not only of the room, but the people too. At one time I created a lecture on no words, and there were dozens of people that said, I just don't have the vocabulary. They are not in the dictionary to describe the experiences. This is just one example. Quote, on, I'm going on. It was a large room and there were many people there standing mostly to either side where the tunnel met the room. <coughs> Excuse me. I didn't recognize or know any of the people. I just knew they were good people with warm, beautiful, smiling faces. On my left was a chorus or a small choir, like a church choir, with about 20 people. They were singing the most beautiful music I have ever heard. They were singing, Nearer my God to Thee. I didn't want to leave the music behind. It was so peaceful and so warming. And again, I don't know why I didn't stay. No one told me not to come in and I felt no reservations. In fact, I wanted to stay. I just didn't do it. I don't remember any of the details of returning through the tunnel. I know there was a reason for what I was allowed to remember and what I don't remember. I don't remember looking down on my body or anything like that. Suddenly, I was back again thinking about my husband and two little children. I loved them and wanted to be with them. I knew how much they needed me. I wanted to stay on earth for them. I remember thinking that if I could just open my eyes, they would know I was there. I was afraid the doctors would give up on me if I didn't give them a sign. We're losing her. She's gone again, the doctors were saying. I wanted desperately to tell them that I was back, but I couldn't make a sound. 
When my eyes wouldn't open, I tried to move a little finger. I couldn't do that either. Though I couldn't communicate with them, the doctors didn't give up on me. I was transferred to American Fork Hospital and remained in the intensive care unit for six days, eventually regaining consciousness and control of my body. I felt like I was allowed to remember this experience beyond the veil, not only for me, but to help other people put their fears of death at ease. As a result of what I experienced, I am no longer afraid to die, and I can share this new confidence in an afterlife with others. The Eternal Journey by Greg R. Lundahl and Harold A. Whittison. I'd show you the cover, but maybe I can get a... Well, there it is. The Eternal Journey. I'm going back to start my quote on page 229. And here again, uh, these two men are professors at different universities, one in Arizona and one in New Mexico, and they are doing some collection of stories and uh, comparisons and research. Okay, quote, Not only did Don Br Brubaker see the world of bewildered spirits. Apparently he was an author, I don't have his book. He went there and was confronted by Satan. Don had rushed to the hospital with symptoms of a pending heart attack. As his doctors wheeled him into an elevator, his heart stopped and he found himself falling feet first into what he described as a dark, damp, musty tunnel. Even though he was on his back, he could see a head in the depths of the horrible tunnel. He saw a large glowing red ball. And obviously I'm sharing this because it contrasts, because this is kind of a negative experience as we'll see. It contrasts with the positive ones. Just again to give you a variety on the continuum of tunnel experiences. Almost like the light on the front of a train, this red ball. In that instant, as the red ball rushed toward me, I knew terror like never before. As it approached, I realized that it was really a large, eerie red eye. It stopped when it got close to me, and then began traveling alongside me through the tunnel. I could hardly stand to look at it. Its gaze was so piercing, it felt like it was looking right into my mind, into my very soul. As the red eye glowed at me, the thoughts began to arrange themselves, coalescing slowly. Suddenly, the idea was undeniable. I was in hell. The realization swept over me like an ocean wave, unstoppable, though I tried desperately to dismiss it. Hell. I didn't even believe in hell. And here I was. This was it. I had only the briefest moment to react to the thought when a deep, comfortable voice echoed through the tunnel. Have no fear, my son, the voice said with a certain resounding nobility, for I am with you. I have chosen you to write about the experience you will go through. I must make a note to get that book. Don Brubaker. 
When Don wondered why he had been chosen to have this experience, the voice responded, You'll, for, you'll first experience hell to prove to you that the rea to prove to you the reality of evil. You've only believed that there was goodness. You must see for yourself that hell is real. And then you can tell others about the awful reality of hell and about the beautiful glory of heaven. When Don asked, But why me, God? He was told, Because you represent common man. You're not a noted minister or a highly educa educated theologian. People will more easily relate to and accept your story. I'm going to give you a hellish experience and a heavenish experience so that you can contrast the two. Next, Glimpses of Eternity by Arvin S. Gibson. I drifted in and out of consciousness. Now, uh, Arvin Gibson uh, has written several books. He would go to people's homes. Uh, he would advertise in word of mouth, and he would go to people's homes with his wife and a tape recorder, and he would sit down and have them tell their story. And after time, oft times he would ask questions and interject. So I'm not going to to point that out to you but you just need to know that this is an interview. I drifted in and out of consciousness and sleep for the next several hours. I remember my husband coming in and going to bed, but it was mostly a haze for three hours until I awoke and found that I could hardly breathe. I was just breathing these little gasps. I tried to lift my arm, but it felt bad. I knew I was in desperate trouble, and I was kind of afraid. All of a sudden, I wasn't there. I was... I was floating. It was so fast, I didn't realize what had happened. And the pain, it was gone. There was this tremendous relief. It was, I don't know, just suddenly, wow! I was floating, I was floating, and there was no pain. I looked up and noticed that I was coming up to the ceiling. I remember wondering what was on the other side of the ceiling, and I went right through. I found myself standing and still moving up. <coughs> Excuse me. And I went into the blackness. I traveled in the blackness, sort of like a tunnel, until I came to this person who blocked the way. There was this person standing in the way, and I couldn't go around, so I stopped. The person was in a brilliant, brilliant light. I was fascinated. Even the hair was lit up. It was beautiful. In fact, the person was beautiful. It was a man. He had this, oh, I didn't know that men could be that beautiful. I wondered who he was, and he identified himself as my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I thought, wonderful. I had this joy that was, you know, welling up inside me. It was like an explosion going on in me. Then he said, almost immediately, that I had to go back. Anne covered her face and began to sob as the memory of that event flooded back. Now this is Gibson. Carol, his wife, and I waited for several minutes while she regained her consciousness. Composure, I'm sorry. 
I ask her gently, you didn't want to go back, I take it. With great difficulty, Anne continued, no, I cried to him, no, please, I don't. You had children then, didn't you? Yes, I had two. Did you know why you had to come back? Was that explained? At first I cried out. I pleaded with him. I didn't want to go back. There was the pain I had just been in. The path, it was far beyond anything I could handle. Well, she goes back. And uh, the, the Savior promises her that if she'll go back, there will be no pain. The reason I included this account is because Jesus Christ is in the tunnel, blocking it, and having this conversation. Uh, that didn't, doesn't happen very many times. Okay, last one in this segment. Uh, comes from Beyond the Light by P. M. H. Atwater and she's written I don't know six, eight books all related uh, for some reason I didn't mark it but I've got it here I had a stomach stapling this is on page 32 I had a stomach stapling in 1980 and, in the process, had to have a deformed spleen removed. I hemorrhaged on the operating table and the doctor said that at three times he thought he was going to lose me. The first day after surgery, I had to have transfusions. During one of the transfusions, I started feeling really weird. I felt like if I shut my eyes, I would never open them again. I called the nurse. Of course she said this was all in my head and left the room. I remember she just walked out the door and I started being pulled through a tunnel. It was a terrible experience because all I could see were people from my past. People who were already dead who had done or said something to me that had hurt me in one way or another. They were laughing and screaming until I thought I could not stand it. I begged and begged that I be allowed to go back. I could see a light. There's Atwater's sketches of the tunnel. She's really into visuals. Uh, I could see a light at the end of the tunnel, but I never really got close to it. And all of a sudden, I was back in my bed, just thankful I had not died. Um, and the reason I include this short one is that in the tunnel experience that this woman has, she's seen people from her mortal life who had had, she had had ne negative experiences with. And, and so this is the last quote from the tunnels. There are others, maybe we'll see, uh, read them and maybe we won't. But uh, now we're, we're going to pick up the next series of lectures, readings, are going to be, okay, I'm out of the tunnel, what happens to me? I didn't do, uh, I, I didn't, I haven't gathered all my quotes on light, and we all know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel in most cases, and uh, I will just have to wait and we'll post that later. But uh, the next uh, discussions are going to be on the life review, which to me are fascinating. 
and there's going to be several uh, lectures on life review. I've got two or three that would take up 15 or 20 minutes and I'm going to have to do some creative paraphrasing but I'll give you the references. So that is the end of the tunnel series. Thank you if you're listening, editor, webmaster.